I guess we can go ahead and start. And hello, Ed, and the, the people in the back sitting there for bad students. You don't want to come forward, no? <laughs> okay. You're happy where you are. Okay. Um, we're very happy today to have Ekaterina Riva with us. Um, and I've heard <coughs> on very short notice that she was coming to Istanbul uh, on her way. Uh, back to Cologne, I assume, from uh, from Beirut, where she gave a talk uh, at Ashtar one in the context of the academy, uh, the school they run there. And Katrina has been, uh, has been recently appointed the director of Academy of Arts of the World, or something of that sort, no? in, in Cologne. And uh, she's been restructuring the program uh, there and she figured it out. And, and she's been also the and right before uh, openspace.ru, the online platform, since uh, for the last two years, so since, since 20, uh, 2012. And last year, in 2013, she uh, co-curated uh, the Bergen Assembly, which was a, a safe binding project that uh, brought in uh, quite a lot of quite a lot of attention. And as Katina was coming to town, I thought it would be great to actually speak about a rather uh, urgent issue which you may have uh, also followed from distance, which is the saga of uh, Manifesto in St. Petersburg, uh, which is not totally unrelated to the uh, to what happened at the Sydney Biennial uh, recently in one way or the other, in terms of uh, withdrawal from exhibitions and boycotts and etc., uh, which is also a, a kind of a Issue that hovers our heads, our, well, our heads also in Istanbul uh, to a degree, and you may also have read recently about what happened with uh, with another touring exhibition that was organized by Creative Time, and there has been another uh, kind of a quite strong boycott against uh, withdrawals from that project as well. So the so the context is kind of larger, perhaps, than the situation on St. Petersburg, or Russia in particular, but uh, St. Petersburg presents, does present a very, I mean, Russia does present a very particular case, I assume. And uh, Katrina gave uh, uh, quite a strong interview at Deutsche Welle recently, about a couple of weeks ago, which I posted on uh, Facebook and Twitter, some of you may have read it. And so without further ado, I'm just going to uh, pass the microphone uh, to her. Um, we're going to start with uh, a reading from, my, uh, from an article that is supposed to go online tomorrow, I assume, yeah. uh, the entirety of the article. Then it will be a form of, it will be a basic form of free-flowing uh, conversation after a page of reading about uh, the context of uh, Manifesta in St. Petersburg. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Basit. So it's okay, yeah, with this talk. Um, so thank you all for coming, and I'm incredibly glad I'm in Istanbul, and that, uh, also glad that on my very short visit I also uh, had a chance to talk to you. So as you see, I'm here and not at Manifesta opening, which is happening, uh, I guess, tomorrow. Uh, it does not mean that I'm boycotting. I actually avoided the term, the gesture of boycott, and I will tell you why, but at the end, I, I was invited to write for the catalog of the manifesto, and I first invited to for closer collaboration with Casper Koenig. I kind of slowly withdrew myself, and I agreed to write the text. Then when all these things happened, I told Casper Koenig that I can only write the text when it will be very critical of the manifesto itself, Rather than he wanted me to write about the political uh, conditions of contemporary Russian art, I told him that I would rather write about the politics of manifesto itself and this particular manifesto, and he agreed to that. But still, uh, the situation was um, deteriorating and deteriorating, and then I simply did not give them this text. So I'm publishing this text instead of that online on the Flux magazine, and I'll just read to you the conclusion of this text, which will give you an idea. It's, the text is very short, uh, but it will give you an idea uh, what it is about. And I will comment to, to make it more understandable for you on the level that it will be reduced. Manifesta has always been part 
of neoliberal urban transformations with the silent consent of all parties involved. And these curators, opportunistic curators, as they were called, manifesto curators in particular, are usually very good at maneuvering and defending their interests and those of the participating parties. Actually, we all know that these kind of exhibitions, where manifesto is the most typical example, uh, created, uh, I could say, know-how or how to criticize institutions with the money of those institutions, so to speak. And institutions, not just art institutions, but in a broader sense, this neoliberal, how to criticize this neoliberal order uh, being paid by, by this same, same neoliberal order. And this is the kind of game which all the parties of this game are playing. Curators, sponsors, artists, uh, they all know how to behave, and they all know uh, that it's all needed uh, for the event. But and it works quite well, yeah, everywhere in the world. But is manifesto ready to mirror this situation when an experimental conservative exhibition, and this is, if I understand right, what Casper Koenig is thinking to create, because it's Hermitage, it's classical tradition, he really likes uh, to uh, have more connections of contemporary art to the classics. What is if this conservative exhibition suddenly begins to resonate all too harmonically with ultra right wing cultural policies, policies initiated by the Russian state? So we all know how it works in neoliberal context, but does it, does it work in the same way uh, in right wing cultural politics uh, context? Over the last years, Vladimir Putin's Russia has unexpectedly turned to realizing a project of perverse decolonization and liberation from Western influences, including that of modern art and even more postmodernism, with the latter term constantly used as an accusation by the authorities. In official documents from the Ministry of Culture of Russia, full of sympathetic quotes from Max Nordau, the author of the term degenerate art, uh, such work is now presented as a mix of, I quote, black humor, cursing, porn, and mediocre shamanism under the slogan of innovation. And innovation is actually it's the name of the state prize for contemporary art, which I got twice. And this is the word for contemporary art inside the Ministry of Culture. So this is a direct, um, direct attack to the prize of innovation. And um, I don't know about black humor, but cursing and porn are now criminalized. Porn, it's clear, but cursing also since recently is criminalized. So maybe black humor as well, and shamanism as well. So the whole contemporary art is under uh, this threat. When contemporary Russian's president rejects Western values, many in the West misread this as a radical critique of capitalism and react with professions of sympathy. Many of my friends in the West, unfortunately, are watching at least in Russia today. However, the point is that the negation of the West in this case negates the inner critique of the West as well, the very notion of inner critique, which is at the base of contemporary art and modernism, for instance. That is, both critical thinking and post-classical art find themselves beyond the law. If we are dealing with the fundamentalist cultural revolution, isn't the reference to the old masters and the classical museum context a step towards for the Russian state? as it demands that artists comply to standards and taboos of high art as opposed to contemporary culture. From the perverse perspective of this new Russian ultra-right-wing conservatism, the critical character of contemporary art gesture embodies the propaganda. So for Putin, it's all propaganda. Propaganda of homosexuality, propaganda of the Western way of life, of tolerance, of multiculturalism, and propaganda of criticality, actually, which is also a Western value. This is what contemporary art is. While classical art embodies the aestheticization. So aestheticization is okay, propaganda is not. In general, the state has no problem with the aestheticization of gay cliches. For instance, you know that gay propaganda is uh, banned and criminalized in Russia. But aestheticization of gay culture, for instance, in pop music, is kind of okay. And aestheticization of westernness in design or architecture is very much okay. It's everywhere in the city, and Russian avant-garde was also successfully domesticated and instrumentalized as a symbol of Russia's eternal glory in the opening ceremony of the Sochi Olympic Games. On the other hand, isn't today's progressive art producing too formalist a language, even if it's a critical language with a left-wing vocabulary, 
to be immune to instrumentalization. It's being instrumentalized very easily, actually. Today's soft dictators were, even if they are anti-Western, they were Armani suits, watch American sitcoms, tolerate some nice contemporary art, and even why not read them that simulate Slavic critics. In a way, Russian cultural authorities, who suddenly became archaically and ridiculously anti-modernist, made manifesto uh, into a heroic deed. They made things look simpler than they currently are. Since Vladimir Putin goes as far as forbidding state employees to write foreign cars, why not just ban any foreign, right, foreign art out there? Under aesthetic censorship, international contemporary art is a protest art by definition, but in a pro broader context, it is not anymore has not been like for the case. The world we live in is more complex than that. There is no guarantee of any emancipatory potential in contemporary art, and neither are there specific forms that would assure us of the correct political behavior of the creators. Increasingly, we hear of such a thing as a left-wing rhetoric, and maybe it's not even just a rhetoric of the right wing, and we see contemporary looking and maybe even contemporary thinking art that embraces nationalism and dictatorship. There are no rules anymore, and each case has been taken separately. The relatively safe common ground of contemporary is shifting, and this incredible complexity is the only hope left. Returning to the notion of boycott, boycott does not embrace complexity. This is my objection to the notion of boycott. This is why I rather call what I'm doing withdrawal, like slow personal withdrawal, rather than boycott. So this was the ending of the text. Can I ask? Yes, yeah, ask please, ask questions. Yeah. Uh, I understand that it was the just a digest, so some of the things might be not uh, really understandable. <coughs> but I mean, why why is the uh, why is the scapegoat contemporary art? culture in particular uh, I mean there's, there's there's a sense in which one could at least perhaps not empathize not accept but at least understand the context of Russia today in the sense mm -hmm. of of NATO you know, coming from the West in quite harsh ways uh, to the, the, the whole Ukrainian situation happening which is another very problem a couple of years ago, the whole situation with Georgia in Ukraine. I mean, it's, it's uh, basically neither the US nor, nor NATO is respecting any of the original, uh, of, of, of the, let's say, the detente, you know, respect of the Russian state, so to speak. And so you can see what, I mean, you can see the level of reaction, how that reaction is being tooled. And, and channeled by why is it in particular being channeled in a very particular sense of, uh, in a particular case, in visual culture and music culture? And Ra why, rather, why than, the, rather than rather what? than rather than create anything else in a way. Well, everything Western is actually slowly, slowly becoming criminalized. Of course, it's uh, but if if they are really speaking about not riding Western cars anymore, if they are really ready to get rid of Visa and Mastercard. This is, uh, this is radical. This is something what nobody would expect, that they're really ready with their anti-Westernism to go all the way. Uh, and this is what actually everybody hoped would never happen, because all these people in the power, the children are studying at Harvard. So it seemed that they are totally integrated into this international cult uh, culture. But, it, well, it turned out that this is not the case. And of course, there is the influence of the church. Uh, and uh, well, gays are uh, a danger for the church because they are not producing children. Uh, and when they are, it's uh, against, uh, again, it's uh, something uh, they cannot accept. So this is anti-anti-Westernism, uh, which was always at the core of, of this Russian church, which is, one has to understand, this is not really a church, maybe you might come to your mind, this is a totally official, State institution. It's a power. It's a big power, also economic power, and we cannot really talk about uh, you know like uh, authentic faith, uh, you know, masses of population 
it was abolished long ago. So the church established itself as a very, very strong uh, political and economical force. And they don't really want to lose this. So this would be my interpretation. Although it can also be, of course, that those things, they s simply work as a cover-up uh, for, for other, other economical things. Because behind this facade, there is still the violent neoliberal revolution taking place. Uh, still just dis massive dispossession, uh, abolition of social uh, rights and privileges, which still were from Soviet times, but they would look massively abolished. And maybe those things, they simply uh, work uh, as a disruption from, from economic uh, interest. Because we still actually, we do not have, uh, unfortunately, any protests based on some economical things, strangely. So people do not protest even if they've been ripped off uh, Possessions of money, but they can protest on ideological, on ideological uh, issues. Can you then elaborate a little bit more to see the difference between boycott and withdrawal, mm -hmm. and perhaps also then bringing the picture to Moscow, where in a way, as it is not itinerant like manifesto, but it is secret. Yeah. Um, boycott has makes sense uh, when it can change something. So when people who are publicly declaring that they are boycotting, maybe one should ask them, uh, okay, what, will you, what do you want to achieve by that? There are situations where one can achieve something. I, I really hope that there are, but it probably was not the case with manifesto. So when people, I understand it as a personal decision. There are people who simply found themselves unable to participate. There are others who still think that by participation rather than non-participation that can change something. That also might be the case. There are also other artists who say uh, that I see, I'm very interested to go there because I've never been there, which is also okay. But most of the you know very loud boycotts in the manifesto situation, not with the other situation, it was about just publicly saying, I'm a good one, so please know that everybody should know that I'm a good one. So this is all again some sort of an empty gesture, uh, exactly I was describing, which is the gesture of contemporary art. Unfortunately, very often today is just a gesture of saying, I don't know, capitalism is bad, with what we kind of heard about. So it doesn't really go beyond that. And those gestures are very easy to domesticize, they're very easy to uh, instrumentalize and actually boycott for me is one of those gestures. Although the situation, all the situations are very uh, different again, and I wouldn't compare it to anything else. My problem with manifesto was not the case that on the stage, you know, the situation changed. It first started when they were just, just well, in comparison to what came after, violation of gay rights in Petersburg. Okay, some people were saying, how can you, Kaspar Koenig, make an exhibition in such a city where there is violation of gay rights? Then other people were saying, okay, what about Dubai and other places? And uh, they also, uh, it's not, you know, even the US is not a paradise. So this is actually hypocritical. Okay, this is hypocritical. And, we, and Kaspar Koenig actually tried to do something about it, to change the situation, to somehow say something on the question of gay rights, if I understand well. Then the situation changed, then now Ukrainian question. Russia is an aggressive state, an oppressor who annexed part uh, of the other country. How can you in this situation just do as if it did not happen? As if it's a normal country and a normal critical exhibition, okay, critical a little bit on every other subjects, but not on that one. Because of course there were no works on this subject, and also, but how can you, like, play this game that nothing is happening. And there were people who started to ask Kasper Koenig uh, what, and Manifesto Foundation, what, uh, what's your attitude to that? At least say something. And they said, and they, what they said was for me the biggest problem. Because they said that Manifesto should present true art, which is above and beyond all politics. And Kasper Koenig said uh, that he will not allow the manifesto would be the place where people would present their political ambitions of any kind. Uh, 
uh, and manifesto should not be misused by those uh, who want to make a political statement. Okay, I was about to write a text in this morning. Okay, so hmm, I'm actually about to misuse manifesto to present some political statement in my text. Hmm, and I'm told that it's not, it should not uh, actually happen and they will not do it. So this was for me the problem. Because in such political situations, of course, when in Russia the public platforms for uh, to, to say something, they are, uh, there are almost nothing left. There is, there is nothing, and not just the television, but almost even just Facebook. We only have Facebook. You know, to, for a journalist, there is no, literally no place to work anymore. Actually, this website I was working on, it's also closed. So there is nothing. So to use Manifesta and the discussions as one of the public platforms, this would have been essential. It would be very, very important, and actually he he invited Joanna Baksha for a public program, let's see what it will be, but he must have told that. But that was for me a problem, what he said, and after that I realized that I can't really identify with this pro project, even I believe it might be an interesting exhibition, but still this attitude in this particular moment, it's not always that you have to produce political art all the time. No, no, not at all. But there are some situations where your non-political exhibition will be read very politically. And this is the thing. I mean, Manifesto, of course, is an interesting history, too. I mean, it's, uh, it has always been a kind of a carrier problem, so to deal with itself. I mean, one was cancelled, that was supposed to take place in uh, Cyprus. Cyprus. Um, again, I mean, it kind of inserted itself in a, in a very, very complicated political uh, situation, and then the Things like in one a part of the exhibition to take place in the, in the in the Turkish part, and then it all kind of erupted into a huge huge crisis that almost brought the that almost brought the exhibition back down. But do you are you singling out manifesto as a particular neoliberal project, or yes, of or course, separately from yeah. all the other biennials that are yeah, actually uh, all the biennials. Uh, now all the biennials, but there are some biennials which uh, um, were born out of other logic, let's say. The Venice Biennial is something completely different. It belongs to the 19th century logic. Then there is Sydney Biennial, there is Sao Paulo Biennial. But starting with the 90s, uh, this biennial project emerged uh, quite massively on this logic, how to use city money, uh, how, to, how to do everything together. So the artist will be doing their thing, criticizing things and exposing the problems of contemporary world, and the city at the same time will, will have more tools. I don't know whether actually they do have more tools, but this is still uh, this idea. And Manifesto is, uh, I guess, one of the most, because the money is involved uh, in a very you know, visible way there. And, and also because they, because they are traveling and because they are always wanted to have this sore points uh, at the same time the sore points has to pay for it it's, it was a very contradictory project which actually many interesting curators very successfully <coughs> used for for interesting exhibitions and interesting artists but there was always this contradiction which now now it's an interesting story what's going on uh, what will happen to manifesta if those uh, interesting places cannot pay anymore. So it's simply impossible that uh, those uh, problematic developing uh, places uh, would, would pay. They don't have money. So now they have to turn to those who do have money, uh, which is St. Petersburg. Uh, I know that they wanted to turn to Kiev uh, you know, ages ago, uh, but actually Kiev said we want our own biennial, rather. So with St. Petersburg it worked, St. Petersburg cannot have their own biennial because there is already one in Moscow. So this was a good good thing. Um, next one will be Zurich, as you know. So it might change change the model. So this interesting poor context now turn into interesting rich context. It also might be very interesting. You know, how to, uh, we did ourselves uh, a triennial in Berlin, which is a rich city in the rich country of Norway. 
So the question was uh, how to how to speak about this context, what what to tell about about this one. Uh, but I guess in Petersburg it will be more about classical art than about it's actually it never says manifesting St. Petersburg. It's manifesting Ermita officially. So it's manifesto among Maxis uh, and Wendler, and not in the city of October Revolution. We have questions. And for those who don't know the history of manifesto, the first one I think was in ninety five. Uh, the project came together at the end of nineteen ninety three with a bunch of uh, you know, uh, older European. Uh, creators are very on René Bloch being, uh, being one of them, and he actually gave the name Manifesta. Uh, so it was René Bloch's invention, and, and the project was invented by the uh, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it was with yeah, Dutch Foreign Ministry money, and the idea was to define Europe after the war, uh, after the fall of Berlin Wall, and, and, and all the European countries were originally part of. Uh, except for Bosnia, that was under bombs during that time, and Turkey, which was found originally outside uh, outside Europe, as as declared not by the Manifesto born in curators themselves, but as declared by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it has a very complicated and interesting history at all levels. Yeah. And questions? National ideo ideological behavior, but after uh, conceptual behavior of Russell, uh, it means uh, Sanat, it is not translation mistake. Uh, contemporary, contemporary art uh, is uh, in the mind different. Uh, in Russian, uh, what is the contemporary art now? What is in contemporary art now in Russia? Yeah, na national ide uh, I ideological uh, behavior look like Sturkey or not? You know what? Uh, I would say that, uh, well, Russia is very similar to Turkey in principle, as a, I mean, historically, also culturally, it's just as I say. In Turkey, you, you see it, that there are different different people with different attitudes, with different attitudes to religion. In Russia, you don't see it. Like everybody looks the same, uh, but still the country has indeed some traditional values and some Western values. And the artists are 100% of the part of the Western values. So there, are, with some exceptions of right-wing artists, who are maybe, I don't know, two Artists, all the other artists, like all the Russian um, intelligent class, yes, so to speak, are imagining themselves being 100% European artists. So this is what they think, this is what they produce, uh, but this is actually not completely true. So, and this becomes to be a problem to me. So I've seen in the work of Turkish artists, and actually even here, during those days, I've seen some of the works, and I've seen some others, you have artists who are dealing with this problem, uh, dealing with this split society and how to work with national and European, uh, Western and traditional, how to put it all together, and many of you actually feel some rift inside, and Russians also do have this rift, but they uh, kind of suppress it. They ignore it, and there is, uh, I know many works of uh, Turkish artists who are dealing with Turkish people, Turkish population of any kind. But I don't know those kind of work of Russian artists at all, almost. Yeah, with maybe exception of Olga Chernyshova or Sergei Barko. Yeah, so these are artists who are actually interested in social landscape, in, in people. What the others are creating rather some kind of formalist work, sometimes more conceptual, sometimes more formalist, but they are more far away from this actually crucial question. 
what's what's this country where it is. Uh, can you elaborate more on the politics of uh, withdrawal, slowly withdrawal, in your country, or, uh, and the boycott? Because to withdraw, you must be in. <laughs> if you are not even in, what can you do? Because I think the best thing to do is, because when you boycott, you are also passive. But I think what can be done is taking this an opportunity yeah. to keep asking questions, but not just asking questions. Being willing to listen to the answers. And asking the question again, if you cannot get the answer you are looking for. I mean, if you are not in, you cannot withdraw and if you boycott. Yeah, but yeah, if you boycott, you can also only boycott if you are in. That's the, there were artists who... Well, I, I can tell you, if I would have been an artist, I would definitely use any opportunity to do uh, to do something very radical and very political. So in this case, I would try to do so. I actually told them so that I'm ready to take part in a discussion, but only if the topic will be like what to do with criminal regime of Vladimir Putin. So I could agree to such to this title. I will not agree to the title. I don't know new tendencies in contemporary Russian art, yeah. uh, but. I guess they cannot do it yeah, because they, they also have their hands are tied. Uh, so I think I really agree that one has to use an opportunity to do things political. Talking about boycott, you know, people are using boycott as, an, as a nice gesture, an example out of different field. There was an exhibition uh, done with Gazprom money in Vienna, and Gazprom is a Russian oil company. Uh, at that point, uh, there was a problem with uh, these Greenpeace people who were arrested on the Gazprom ship or something like that. So it was an international scandal, and one artist from Russia very publicly said that he's withdrawing his work, he's boycotting the exhibition, and since his work was on the cover of the catalog, there were problems, but still they, they said yes, yes, they agreed, they withdrew his work. But it was an exhibition of the Gazprom collection. This work didn't even belong to him anymore, you know. He was what he, he couldn't even actually withdraw his work from this exhibition. What he could do, he could say, I'm giving your money back and don't exhibit you, don't dare, don't you dare to exhibit my work anymore. But he didn't say. But it just didn't occur to him because he's not thinking politically. So one has to be careful with the notion of political. But I can agree that there are situations with this uh, uh, Guggenheim, for instance, uh, you know, boycotting uh, with a clear political program and with a clear claim, not just boycotting, but asking for something. Uh, so this is an important uh, gesture when you can really achieve something with that. And the project called Dove Labor, which is uh, yeah. uh, run by a series of artists, uh, mostly artists, uh, mostly based in New York, in the States, and, and uh, it's, uh, and the project is not as on a simple boycott of, of the of the Abu Dhabi uh, Guggenheim project or the NYU campus that's being built there, but more so about the workers' conditions in Abu Dhabi, and workers who are, actually, those workers who are uh, part of the, part of the construction process, so the the actual boycott is directly, uh, I mean, uses uses the Guggenheim as a ploy, so to speak, to speak about the larger issue, and it's been quite extremely, extremely successful at many levels, I and mean, both performatively very successful. Also, uh, it's 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 it has brought, I mean, has brought an arrogant institution to almost to its knees, uh, having to face the having to face the context or or lose all kinds of credibility over the over the long run. Not that these institutions ever lose credibility, but their history is longer than the very present moment, so time will tell. I mean, actually, it's interesting, and there's one thing just before perhaps we close it, uh, maybe we can, I mean, this would be a discussion for actually for the, more for the floor, and there's, there seems to be quite I mean, uh, radical similarities between Turkey and, 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 and Russia at the moment in terms of politics. In terms of uh, the institution, I mean the, the institution of religion, or mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in Turkey's case, it will be the Sunni, uh, uh, the Sunni institution in the, in the country, 
in terms of politics is the uh, and the top down uh, system and one man kind of supposedly one person system is interested in terms of also uh, also in terms of kind of charting out the way the way the kind of the culture policy has been charted out especially in the last years in the sense in, in the sense that uh, whatever is seen that is coming out of contemporary artists of visual production is labeled and, and, and branded and, and actually framed as European or Western henceforth uh, outside the outside the body. So, so it's not part of the body, it's, it's an outside uh, operation. Uh, not in terms of uh, what it does, but in terms of the networks and the structures in which it operates. So it's not really about what you show, but it's about the whole operation you show. So that's so there's a sense that it all does want to be ready to change that whole system, and it's, it shows in the new culture, uh, in the new um, uh, arts law, finance law, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. And that that is supposed to be a total overhaul of the whole cultural funding system in the in the, in the country. And all of these things are quite uh, similar. Because there is a supposed kind of original body, be it the Russian body or the or the Anatolian Turkish whatever body, and and that body does not the, the, the narrative is that that body is not quite accepting the the history of modernity and uh, what what comes afterwards. Yeah, and I would say that the Bolsheviks did work with that. Uh, it's whether it was successful or not, whether it was good, but they, they really were acknowledging this pro problem, and they were very much into education of society. And actually it was not one-dimensional, not just that we put this in your heads, they were also listening to what people had to say. And so this Soviet culture was in a way somehow created from both sides. But this is not, not absolutely not the case anymore. As I see now, the contemporary art world, starting with the end of 80s, uh, was creating their own utopia of uh, contemporary art totally unrelated to the rest of society, and I was myself part of this illusion. So that's what we wanted to do, like as if it was always the case and nothing else ever existed, and did not invest at all into any kind of audience, didn't even want it. And the audience is now being imposed uh, by in the city of Moscow, for instance, it's also not real, real people. These are kind of rich, upper class, uh, I don't know, designers, uh, young people of this kind, which is also not, not the reality. So this is also Western. So it gives, you know, so the accusation, it creates an accusation. This is all just Western uh, thing. Thank you. Thank you for coming.